Alright, what are you Turks? Oh, get out the way, yo. Get out the way. Oh, we got a steamroller of a show coming for you today. Uh, you're crazy if you miss today's show. You're mental if you miss it, okay? First off, the Republicans keep getting crazier and crazier on oil drilling. Their new excuse is fantastic. On the guy, the New York uh, City bomber, the one in Times Square, they're getting nuttier and nuttier on that. A hypocrisy that literally, as I was reading, I, I was at my terminal and I went, oh, unbelievable. Every day they top themselves. That's coming a little bit later in the program. And then, uh, the th I love the second hour. You know how we're doing the uh, different hours today, politics and then uh, pop culture and then uh, the interviews. In the second hour, we got these stories that... I if we only did the second hour alone, we'd do a fantastic show. God, I love that uh, those stories, including Justin Bieber. I'm sure 98% of you don't know who he is. But uh, there's a great follow-up. Uh, the Young Turks are going to offer a pardon, and, and, and uh, we're actually going to change our mind on an issue. Most reasonable show in America. Okay, that's dramatic. It's happening in the second hour, among many other things. And then in the third hour, if all of that weren't enough, Ken Blackwell. Republican Secretary of State in Ohio, who some people believe fixed the 2004 elections in favor of George W. Bush. Uh-oh. On the program. He's on the program. He's going to come accompanied, but we'll see how it goes. Okay? Uh, and then um, Alex Albrecht, who's the head of, uh, or who's a host of Dig Nation, Totally Rad Show. Great guy on the Internet. Huge. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, British elections are happening. Uh, we got a live report from Britain on the Young Turks. Over, okay, and we're going to cover a story here that the ma major press is not covering, and uh, and we're going to kick some ass on it. All right, so get too much show. Let's get to it. All right, and by the way, I haven't even teased the the one thing I'm, because I'm going to do it in the first segment. It's the story of the day. It's the story of the week. Oh, uh, just hold on, hold on. Just give me a minute, and I'm going to get to that story. This is why I love doing this show. All right, let's go forward. Uh, number one, I want to start with good news. Okay, it appears it's an early note. It's not 100% yet, but it appears that the Obama administration is going to have the FCC regulate uh, the cable providers and make sure that they provide net neutrality. Oh, my God. Oh. Okay, now, why did I lead with that story? Okay, because... Number one, remember yesterday I laid it out as a marker because it looked like they were going in the wrong direction. And there was a, they got a lot of pressure uh, from a lot of people uh, saying, hey, you've got to turn around, you've got to turn around. And I said, look, if they sell us out on this, that means they, they, that whole change thing was garbage. That the minute they have an opportunity to do the corporations a single favor, they'll do it, right? Because the net neutrality, if you're not familiar with it, it's just simply letting the Comcast, Verizon, AT&T, the guys who actually bring the cables into your house to uh, give you the Internet, letting them control uh, what sites really uh, are slower, which sites are faster, and hence allow them to control all the content, including the content they like and don't like on the Internet. It's hideous. That's a very, very important issue. It's critical that Obama be on the side of net neutrality, as he said during the campaign. And today, he went in the right direction. Credit where credit is due. It was an important marker. Now, it's not over yet, you gotta, you know, and we'll obviously uh, track that story for you. But I, like I keep telling you, I'm dying to give you good news. This is good news. So he delivers on a promise here, it looks like. So uh, we'll keep you up to date. That's, I'm very excited about that. Uh, number two, quick, uh, speaking of giving credit to people, quick note. You know how uh, we were talking on Monday about Obama's uh, killer jokes at the White House Correspondents' Dinner? Uh, well, I found out uh, who wrote the jokes. Because we were wondering, man, those jokes were great. Who the hell wrote those jokes? And he did a good job of delivering them, et cetera. It's not like Obama's staying up at night and be like, all right, let's see, what joke can I write about Eric Massa and the tickling, right? Somebody writes it for him. Um, well, uh, it's, and by the way, I found this out because somebody tweeted it to us. I should give them credit. Let me see if I can real quick find for you guys uh, the guy who sent it to us. Um, yep, uh, John Vid, uh, J-O-N-V-I-D, uh, sent it on Twitter to us. Uh, it turns out it was the Daily Show writers. Uh, only the most logical thing in the world. He's like, yeah, can you help the brother out with these jokes? They're like, yeah, we got it. Step aside, Butch. And they wrote the jokes, gave it to Obama. He killed with them. So uh, now you know uh, through the power of Twitter. Now, are you ready? Are you ready for the story of the day? Oh, God. <laughs> these stories give me some sort of joy. 
Well, it's the story of George Allen uh, Wreckers. He is a Baptist minister. In fact, he's one of the most prominent anti-gay activists in the country. Can you already see where this is going? <laughs> okay, let's warm it up. Uh, he's a leading scholar of the Christian right. He's one of the organizers of the Value Summit. That's where the Republicans come and say, oh, yeah, Christian right, of course, we're totally with you. We hate the gays, absolutely, right? Uh, he is uh, gone to uh, Harvard uh, as a, a scholar there. Uh, he's had advisory uh, roles with Congress, the White House, Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, he's advised Florida on their gay adoption ban. And he's spoken on many issues, how to cure gays, uh, how to make sure that gays don't adopt anybody because it's uh, unacceptable and uh, unchristian, etc., of course. And he's written a book called Who Am I? Uh, Lord, and growing up straight, what families should know about homosexuality. Now, th this guy seems to have homosexuality on, on the uh, mind a lot, you know? You want, so whenever I see a case like that, I always wonder, like, why is this guy obsessed? What, what, what's with all the, like, oh, that's a gays, don't let him do anything. Oh, gays are dangerous. Gays, gays, they're coming, they're coming inside my mind. So, and here we go. New Times in Miami has broken a story about his travel companion, a young gentleman he met on rentboy.com. Rentboy.com is a uh, website that advertises for gay men. And uh, they have uh, different categories. For example, uh, you can pick a rent boy, or you could say you're a sugar daddy, or you could just uh, be a masseur or someone looking for a full service massage. Hmm. Now, what happened with this? Uh, who is this guy that he selected, and what kind of travel uh, were they doing? Well, it turns out they were going to go on a lovely vacation to Europe, and even have emails uh, from the good Baptist minister talking about, oh, I can't wait for the vacation. We're going to have such a good time with you, rentboard.com. Okay, the, the guy he found. Now, look, maybe it, he just happened to go on a gay site accidentally. And by the way, it's not on Google. You can't, so it's not like you can go and accidentally wind up on this guy's page like Match.com, etc., you have to go to that website. And it turns out this guy they're calling Lucian, uh, the, his travel companion, he was on page two. So you'd have to go onto the website, you'd have to click, yes, I'd like to enter, and then go through their different categories, in this case, the Rent Boys, go to page two, find the Rent Boy you like, and then select this guy who advertised himself as somebody with a, quote, smooth, sweet, tight ass. All right, ear off to kids, and a perfectly built eight-inch cock, uncut. <laughs> He's explaining that. He also explains, uh, this particular rent boy, that he is sensual, wild, and up for anything, as long as, of course, you have the money to pay. And it turns out, uh, George Allen Records did have that money, and he bought him a ticket, uh, took him to Europe with him, had a nice little vacation, came back, New Times sees him at the airport, takes some pictures, hey, how you doing? That's him carrying his luggage. But what's interesting is when they ask him, hey, why are you traveling with this rent boy gentleman? Uh, this young uh, male that you, you know, because I know you're not gay. Of course not, right? No, no, you hate the gays, right? Wrecker said, quote, I had surgery. I, I can't lift my luggage. That's why I hired him. Right. Of course you did. Of course you did. <laughs> yeah, I know. When I have trouble lifting something, I usually go to rentboy.com and see if I can find a boy who is sensual, uh, wild, and has a smooth, sweet, tight ass to see if he could do lift my lifting for me. And I take him on a week-long vacation to Europe. That's usually how it goes. Okay. Oh, go, 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 go. Yeah. Look. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Yeah. <laughs> when, <laughs> when talking to Lucian, uh, the New Times. Lucian didn't want to throw the Wreckers under the bus. He's like, well, you know, it was my travel companion. But he did admit that Wreckers like to, quote, hang out with younger guys. Huh, interesting. Uh, and um, uh, we have emails from Wreckers saying, I'd like to propose another trip to Rome, Italy for a week or more. This is so exciting to have a nice travel assistant and traveling companion. Wow, I'm so glad I met you. I'm sure it was fabulous.
Now, this story takes a slightly uh, disturbing uh, note. At the end of the piece, uh, New Times piece, they note that uh, Rackers, of course, who's against uh, gay adoption and, and teaches courses on how to turn gay people into straight uh, folks. I don't know if he's gone through his own course. Uh, has adopted uh, some, oh, I'm sorry, he's a foster parent for some kids. Okay, no problem, right? He is a foster parent he chose to be for a 16-year-old boy. Ah, uh, that's where it gets serious. That's where I, you know, I'd look into it. Now, you know, I love the rent boy stuff, and I think it's hilarious. And this guy is obviously the most flaming guy, gay guy in the whole country, right? And there's nothing wrong with any of that. But when you got a guy that is so bottled up and so denying his own reality, and goes on uh, rentboy.com to find young male, uh, basically prostitutes, to take on vacations with him, and then of all the kids in the world to do uh, to be a foster parent of. He finds a 16-year-old boy to be a foster parent of. Uh, that, that is cause for concern, man. That really is. And here's another cause for concern. Listening to any of these Christian right idiots who uh, come out and say, Oh, no, no, gay, gay people. Oh, no, no, we should ban their adoption. Make sure they don't get married. We should do all this stuff. Look, when you hear that from somebody, it's a near guarantee that they're gay. Okay. It, because almost every story we've done, it, it, oh, they're the gays, oh, they're ruining the country, oh, we're getting me some young boys with sweet tart asses. Every single one of them. You, when you hear it, look, you, when you hear from the major figures, the, the major Christian right figures, major politicians in the country, I think it is very fair to assume that those people are gay and, and hate themselves and are doing some sort of inter-gay battle, okay? And, uh, you know, the out gays versus the closeted gays, it's, it's crazy, right? But even in your own area, you know, you got a guy in school or whatever who's like, oh, yeah, you're gay. Check his computer. Nearly guaranteed he's on rentboy.com. Okay. Don't check his computer. Leave him alone. Okay. But I'm just telling you, that, that's what's happening in the country. And it's so blaringly obvious, and it's made more obvious by guys like Wreckers who needs a little help with the heavy lifting. You know, oh, yeah, oh, you want to help me get that on my back? Yeah, I'm having trouble lifting. Come on. We see you, Wreckers. We see you. <laughs> and uh, one last thing from the New Times. They said uh, when, asked, uh, when they asked Wreckers, hey, what do you plan on doing on that vacation? He said, I plan to release the Kraken. <laughs> okay, all right. Have I done enough damage? <laughs> and look, the reason I delight in that story is because... They're all so full of crap, okay? And they're, they're, they're dangerous, and they affect our policy, and I love exposing them, okay? And by the way, I don't know why that's not on every major, I mean, do they, television, I mean, they just let us take their lunch money, man. They, that's all they're doing, okay? They don't know how to do television anymore. Why is that not on CNN? Well, that's not an interesting story? What, really? People are, oh, yeah, yeah, the, one of the leading anti-gay activists in the country is going on vacation with a boy he rented online with a sweet, tight ass. Ah, that's not interesting. I'll just change the channel. No, because they're scared to death. They're like, oh, I don't want to offend anybody. Oh, my God, these people are in power with the Christian right. I don't know. No, please, 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 no. Don't put it on television. They're crazy. All right, no, no, no. You don't put it on television. I'll put it on here on theyoungturks.com. Yeah, that works out for you. Okay, so now, um, <laughs> speaking of uh, Republicans with uh, crazy sexually suggestive, uh, you know, in this case, an ad, right? I mean, they're out of control. They really are. Okay. So now we got a, a situation in Ohio. We got uh, pe people running for the Senate seat, of course, in 2010. And uh, Republican Senatorial Committee has released an ad targeting uh, one particular Democratic Senate candidate, Lieutenant Governor Lee Fisher. Now, uh, Lee Fisher ran with Ted Strickland, who became governor. Uh, so, that, you know, of course, that's Lee Fisher's the Lieutenant Governor of Ohio. Now he's going to run for senator. And uh, there was a documentary during the Ted Strickland's governor's run, uh, actually shot by Fisher's own son. And in that documentary, there was a shot of Fisher without a shirt on at one point, working on a memo for the campaign late at night. And he said, I couldn't sleep. I really I, I wanted to get this idea out. It's just a small, tiny shot from that documentary. He just doesn't happen to have his shirt on. It's not a big deal. He's in his own home, right? Okay, now they took that, and get a load of the ad they made on it, and how they twisted it. Only Republicans. Here you go. I'm the lieutenant governor. I focus on economic development. 
I admit my job as lieutenant governor has kept me pretty busy, kept me pretty busy. Job creation and saving jobs are number one priority. I'm the lieutenant governor, I focus on economic development. I'm the lieutenant governor, I focus on economic development. People are more focused on results than ever before. Not just words, but results. I, I love the little uh, part of the ad with the women being like, oh! Have you ever seen a more grossly, literally grossly misleading ad in your life? Because they have no shame, they have no boundaries, they have no rules. So they just say, okay, we'll take a picture of this guy with a shirt, without a shirt on, and imply that I guess he's masturbating. I mean, with, with the job reference, was that worried more about his job, and they have a picture of me like, than your job? <laughs> they, they run that ad, they literally run that ad as if, like, th this guy spends his whole time in his office masturbating. <laughs> And then Democrats are worried about being polite to the other side. They're worried about bipartisanship and reaching out. Whenever a Republican reaches out to you, to a Democrat, it's to smack you in the face. What kind of despicable ad is this? And by the way, economic development in the sorry state of Ohio and the jobs there. Gee, I wonder who's responsible for that. How about your president that caused the greatest economic crash since the Great Depression? You think that might have had something to do with losing some jobs in Ohio? While he was busy giving tax cuts to the richest Americans in the country, and then as he was leaving office, he's like, I'm sorry about that. Hey, you know, oh, this is going to be as bad as the Great Depression. Oh, you got to give me a bailout. <laughs> that guy had nothing to do with it, right? It was Lee Fisher, because he didn't have a shirt on once. Spickable, man. And if you vote for a Republican, you're a sucker of the highest order. Everything they tell you is a lie. I mean, look, you can see it for yourself. This, was any part of that ad true? Was any of that uh, part of that ad in any way defensible? Where you say, well, no, it's, it makes sense that within the context of the Senate race, they should show this guy shirtless and imply that he's uh, pleasuring himself. If you think that's a fair ad, okay, then you're a Republican and an asshole. Okay, have at it, Hoss. Be in that party. All right. <laughs> now, uh, I got to take a break. <laughs> and when I come back, I got more fire and fury. Young Turks. All right, back on the Young Turks. Now, you understand this week what's happening, right, everybody? Uh, we're starting an hour early every day, and then uh, we're going politics, pop, and then uh, generally interviews, but I got more uh, news for you guys in, in the third hour as well, okay, a little catch-all. So uh, we're just playing around with some stuff here. Everybody calm down, all right? That's number one. Uh, number two, uh, the first thing we do is we go out and punch people in the mouth. All right, uh, number two... Uh, t we were going to have uh, coverage of the British elections in the next hour, and we decided it's better uh, after we get the results. Okay, mm -hmm. so we're going to do that coverage uh, live uh, from the United Kingdom on tomorrow's program. Okay, uh, with uh, Shivala, uh, who uh, is all right. Um, anyway, uh, who's a reporter in uh, Great Britain uh, with the Guardian, uh, among other places. Okay, and uh, we're going to get you some information real quick. We're going to get you some information as to where she's going to do her live report from. Mm -hmm. So if you're, uh, you know, watching the, in, in Great Britain and you want to go and, you know, be in the background or whatever, I don't know. Yeah, cool. That'd be awesome. So live coverage of the British elections and uh, maybe some Young Turks uh, folks in the background. So now we're going to tell you where that is, but we don't have that information yet. So check out our website, Twitter, Facebook, la la la, yes. ba da da, and we'll put up that information. La la la, ba da da. Ba da da, da da da. Okay. All right, one more thing uh, before I forget. Uh, tomorrow I'm on uh, Dylan Radigan's show at 4 o'clock Eastern. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm bringing it. Uh, Dylan told me to... Uh, Release the Kraken! And I will. Uh, he didn't say that. But anyway, uh, I will do it nonetheless. So check that out uh, tomorrow at 4 o'clock. Also, uh, before I forget, I have a super personal and funny story to share in the post game today. You know, when you say stuff like that and I don't know what it is, it makes me want to be a member. <laughs> oh, right, I'm on the post-game show, so I'm going to find out. I don't know right. what it is, so I'm interested. It's involving a TYT fan. Oh. Yes. Interesting. So okay, you guys will even, see what even it's more about. interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, we have a very important update on a story we covered yesterday. Uh, the hot issue at hand is, is Justin Bieber an idiot 
or is he not? Okay, it's a very, very important question. Right. Um, and yesterday we uh, covered the issue about whether he knew what the word German was. Right. Uh, he was having an interview with a reporter in New Zealand, and the reporter asked him whether or not his last name meant basketball in German. Well, Justin Bieber kept saying, what, what? What? And then finally the reporter showed him the card that had German written on it, and he's like, uh, we don't use that word in, in the United States, right? So everyone's like, ah, look at Justin Bieber, he's an idiot, he doesn't know what uh, German is. Well, it turns out we're the idiots. He does know what German is. In fact, uh, his great-grandfather is German, and we have a video of him speaking German. Uh, by the way, I wouldn't go as far as she did. I, I mean, oh, we're the idiots. Okay, and if some people were criticizing him. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, look, look, look. We have the video. Let's watch the video together and let's see. Now, this was, of course, in 09, before the New Zealand controversy. And we'll see if he understands what the concept of German is. Okay. And your name is German, so um, what's your relation to Germany? Um, well, my great-grandfather is actually from Germany, mm -hmm. so, so yeah. Okay, so can you speak any German? Um, I can count to ten. Okay. <laughs> okay, do it. Eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf. Sex, sieben, och, neun, same. Yeah, okay. that was perfect. Thank yeah, you. Er hat gerade gesagt, dass sein äh, Großvater aus Deutschland ist. Not guilty. <laughs> totally and utterly not guilty. <laughs> Let him go. Let him go. Okay. Right. All right. Look, look, look. Uh, we're the most open-minded show in America. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I happen to be the most reasonable man in America. Uh, unlike uh, some people in the right wing of this country, I am not impervious to facts. You show me a fact, I go, uh, yeah, yeah, the kid knows what German means. Uh, not only is his grandfather from there, he counted in German. Right. He definitely knows what German means. Absolutely. So we, uh, we, we might have jumped the gun a little bit there on the uh, Justin Bieber and, uh, stuff. You know, now nah, I'll make up stuff. You know, I was a little skeptical about that story anyway. Uh, because, I mean, who doesn't know what German is? That's like saying door. What does door mean? I think your commentary you know. yesterday was inexcusable. <laughs> so I, I don't even know how you can come on the show today and act as if it's not that big of a deal. It was a very inexcusable. I can't even believe it. Anyway, he goes on his Twitter account, and uh, he wants to denounce and reject everyone who called him a moron, right? I'm going to read you his tweet. He says, uh, guess homeschooling is working out. Do your research next time before making a lame attempt at hating on a 16-year-old. All right, first of all, we went after him on the homeschooling. Yeah. So on that note, I have to say... I regret it. I'm sorry. I'm saying I'm sorry. That was just my mistake and my bad. I'm oh. sorry. Okay, so that's number one. Okay, mm -hmm. Number two, I don't like that he used the age card there. He's like, oh, yeah, you're hating on a 16-year-old. Well, dude, I mean, come on. No, okay. I like that he used the age card because it's correct. <laughs> We, well, I mean, we, he is 16, but, dude, everybody knows German. Like, if he was, you know, if he didn't know what Urdu is mm -hmm. and where they speak the language Urdu, and we're like, <laughs> okay, and then he says, look, dude, I'm 16. I didn't get to Urdu yet. Then, okay, that's fair, mm -hmm. but everybody knows German. That's back when we thought he didn't know what German meant, okay? Mm -hmm. I think he's uh, dealing the race card from the bottom of the deck. I mean, the age card. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> All right, now I'm playing, I'm playing. He, he's allowed to say whatever he wants. And then that, it gets even worse for us because it turns out he thought the guy was saying Jew man. Like, hey, is it true that it means basketball and Jew man, right? Like Jew man. He's like, and so he must have saw the card wrong because what convinced me yesterday was because he looked at the card right. with the word German written on it. And that's what made us think, oh, what the hell, right? So, but... It turns out he was totally confused and thought it said Juman. And, and that, that's why it makes sense that he said, we don't use that word or, or we don't know what that, we don't say that in America. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes, I do. All right, so uh, Justin, full and complete pardon issued by the Young Turks. Enjoy. Okay, I'm cool with y'all's pardon I'm, or your, um, your apology and your backpedal. <laughs> <laughs> what, you trying to say something? You do it well. Um, <laughs> what are you gonna do? <laughs> no, 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 I got I want to show and deny it. Like, yeah, like, I know. No, we're still right. We're still right. He doesn't know what German is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what this tough guy's stance on this is. No, you're gonna still hate on no, him. Uh, still pour some hater hate on him and see what happens. I'm not gonna hate him. I'm just saying, we went overboard, right? Yesterday, mm -hmm. with saying who, who knows what he means, la la la, right? Um, he saw the card. What did the card say? Did it say J E W M A N? What did it say? Now, now, it, it so, must and, have well, happened real quick, though. I hear right. you, but I, 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 like, understand you can't hear the dude because right. he's like, German, and German. We, and we said, like, how would you, man? What the fuck? Yeah, yeah we said that yesterday when we're yeah. like, we don't understand what the guy said either. Right. Uh -huh. Fine. 
as I'm saying, I have no problem with, with your back pedal. I'm just saying that don't go too far mm-hmm. the other way. Yo, I'm not saying Justin Bieber's a genius. Well, you <laughs> said, oh, my God, he counted to 10. He knows the German language. No, he doesn't. No, I'm not saying he's fluent in German. It's not like, yeah, I'm a kartoffelsalat, you know, and I'm a gewurzat. Okay, schlupen das, das ist vitamin. Okay, I'm not going that far. It just sounds that way. That's all I'm no, saying. That's all no, I'm saying. It's, it's just... okay. C- correct, correct your mistake, but don't say, ah, and ch- Justin Bieber. The next Michael Jackson. Let's calm down with everything. Let's just, <laughs> I didn't say that I'm just saying we're going too. Talent. I'm just saying we're giving too much now. It's just uh, yeah, you, wrong about that. But now stop. Uh, all right. Okay. I just have one last thing to say about it, and it's actually Anna recorded this earlier in the day. Oh my God! I am totally, 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 totally sorry for that. <laughs> all right. So Justin, our, our mistake and our bad, as Tim Hardaway would say. All right. What's next? Okay, uh, we have a man in Spain who has had the second face transplant ever in Spain. His name is Rafael. We have a video showing you what he looks like now after the face transplant. So let's go to the video. I'll give you a little more uh, information about his condition. It's a victory for the Spanish man who underwent a partial face transplant in January as he walks out of a hospital in Seville with doctors and family in tow. This is the first time the man, identified only as Rafael, has appeared in public since the 30-hour operation four months ago. Doctors replaced the bottom two-thirds of his face because of a congenital disease that left it deformed with benign tumors. Months of rehabilitation await him, but Rafael can now distinguish between hot and cold and feel pain in his lips. And he used those lips to kiss his surgeon as he posed with the medical staff, dosing out hugs flanked by his very proud mom. At a news briefing, he thanked the donor's family and said he felt happiness and joy. Doctors say after the surgery, Raphael looked in the mirror and liked what he saw. All right, uh, there you have it. Uh, so, so he had benign tumors all over his face, and uh, that's the reason why he needed to have the face transplant. When they removed the tumors, it just destroyed his face. And what's amazing about that is, if you look at the lower bottom of his face, right, the lower part, portion of his face, it, it looks pretty good considering the condition he was in prior to the surgery. And, I mean, you compare the bottom of his face to the top part, and there's no comparison. Uh, Raphael, and that's only uh, how they identify him without a last name, um, is actually the second guy in Spain uh, to get a face transplant. Mm-hmm. And so uh, it's amazing what they can do. I mean, obviously, you look at him and you say, okay, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not ideal. Uh, they haven't mastered the art yet, obviously, right? Uh, but at the same time, he has a face now, which he didn't have before. And so, as Bush would say, we're making progress. Not only that, it's amazing that he can now feel hot and cold, whereas before he wasn't able to. Yeah, absolutely. And then, uh, you know, of course, your heart goes out to the guy. He, he said, look, everybody was incredibly curious about this, so we came out and did it for the cameras, uh, obviously. And I just, please, after this, uh, leave, leave me, me alone. alone. Yeah. He's like, look, I know everybody's curious about it, but... At the same time, it's really hard for us to deal with it. It's hard for our family to deal with it. So, look, we did this for the press. That's enough. Please leave us alone after this, mm-hmm. okay? And, um, and, and that makes sense, and, and everybody should respect his wishes. So, look, uh, my sense, of course, is that we will get better and better at this, at the face transplants. The early ones are, are rough. I mean, we've done a couple of these stories now, and they're rough. Uh, but... But I, I love that at least he's got some feeling back and, and that we're on the road to getting better at this. And as soon as we do master face transplants, Heidi Montag will be the first one to get one in the United States to look like Dolly Parton. <laughs> yeah, there's <laughs> no question. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then, of course, uh, Nick Cage's face will go on John Travolta's face, and John Travolta's <laughs> face will go on Nick Cage's face, and then we'll be all be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> we won't be able to keep up. That'll be fun. Oh, no. You know what? I hadn't thought of it that way, Anna. You're entirely right. So many idiots are going to try to get face transplants if we make it, you know, a million times better than it is now. Right, of course. Right. Oh, yeah. They're going to want to look like other people. I mean, we it's did a disaster in the making. We did that story from Japan, the girl who uh, had her boyfriend break up with her because she didn't look enough like Jessica Alba. So she went off and got plastic surgery to look as much like Jessica Alba as she could. Uh, 
it, uh, pe of course people are going to do it. There's no question about it. I mean, yesterday we saw the screening of Iron Man 2. The whole time I was thinking, what can I do to make myself look like Scarlett Johansson? She's amazing. It's <laughs> <That's> ridiculous. <laughs> no, I would never, okay, I would never undergo plastic surgery to look like anyone. I swear to God. But, man, she looked good in that movie. And, yeah, and that, well, that's <laughs> definitely true. And I was thinking, what can I get my do to myself to make sure I don't look like Mickey Rourke? I know. Wow. Wow. Okay. Are his fingers naturally dirty like that? D no, his <laughs> I'm hands. I'm sure they did it for the movie. I, but they're but they always look so dirty. I know, I know. He's got some issues. I know. Okay. Uh, he's a great actor, though. Uh, our review of Iron Man two, of course, on Friday on What the Flick uh, at uh, five o'clock Eastern, and uh, I'm going to go in a surprising direction. So everybody, get buckle up for that. I'm expecting the surprising. No, oh, you are. Direction, okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Maybe um, you'll get surprised too. Did you think about that? <laughs> All right, let's go to the next story. Uh, Aaron Andrews is in the news again because Elizabeth Hasselbeck is uh, saying terrible things about her and then backpedaling. So yep. let's start with the terrible things that she says. Elizabeth Hasselbeck is on The View. We have a video of this, so uh, let's get it ready. And she talks about Aaron Andrews' uh, costumes during Dancing with the Stars. She uh -oh. basically says that they're too revealing. So let's go to the video. Release the Kraken! <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell that sometimes we struggle with technology? Or as Ali G would call it, technology. We have some technology issues. I can read what she said, if that's easier. All right, let's give it one last shot here. If not, Anna will read it. Go. These are some of the great moments in Young Turks history when we try to get the recordings right live. I we'll do it live! I always think of O'Reilly when these moments happen, like how he would react to it. Oh, he'd lose it. Here we go. Uh, disaster. All right. Okay, I'm going to read her comments. Okay, but no must. No must. No must. <laughs> oh, what am I doing? Happy Cinco de Mayo, everybody! <laughs> Happy Cinco de Mayo! Congratulations, everybody! Oh, man. <laughs> this is the worst story of the day. Okay, be cool, be cool. <laughs> Hug a Mexican today, man. Yeah, you drink a cerveza. Okay. Uh, Have a margarita. Okay, Jesus, uh, I'm going to hug you after the show, okay? So get ready for that, okay? Uh, Jesus, uh, share us some warm stories about uh, Cinco de Mayo. We interrupt the story for an important Cinco de Mayo announcement. <laughs> Uh, your favorite Cinco de Mayo moment uh, in your life. Go. <laughs> I, I guess, I don't know, play, I guess performing in middle school, the last one I can remember. The, yeah, we used to do performances in middle school. Oh, really? What, what was it for? Did they involve yeah, Corona? The celebrations, you know. But I don't know. I mean, we usually just go out and have fun on days like this. <laughs> well, what was the performance? See, I knew I was going to get something interesting out of you. What's the word like? You, da, 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 yeah, they, just, da, da, yeah. <laughs> they, they have the girls dancing, folklorico, and, you know, the boys have to be partners and all that stuff. So you, like, you would practice it, and then you'd go out there with Vanya and be like, Whoa, da, 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 da. Not with Vanya, but it was, I was in third grade or so. Okay. I <laughs> By the way, this apparently is my version of Mexico. <laughs> dancing for uh, Mexican tradition. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. You know what that's going to lead to? Um, uh, why I always re remember Cinco de Mayo's story in the post game mm -hmm. show. Mm -hmm. Okay. And a dance I had to do when I was in third grade that led to disaster and led to decades of insecurity for myself. Uh oh. Okay. <laughs> That's in the post game. That's that's the personal stories for the members. Okay, so now back to let's restart. Aaron Andrews, Elizabeth Hasselman. Okay, oh, when we restart, are we going to restart with the video, or should I just read her comments? No, we're going to read her comments. <laughs> that's what we decided to, right, right here on the air. We'll do a lot. Okay, okay, let's okay. Do but it. then we'll play the second video. Okay, so let's do it. Go. Uh, Aaron Andrews is in the news because Elizabeth Hasselbeck was on The View uh, talking about the costumes that she chooses to wear on Dancing with the Stars. Now, Aaron Andrews has been, is it working now? No. 
This is the most disastrous story <laughs> ever. <laughs> ever. <laughs> All right, anyway, they hate each other, okay? No, they don't. They don't. Look, here's the situation. Hasselbeck goes after Aaron Andrews because she's wearing skimpy clothing on Dancing with the Stars. Here's Elizabeth Hasselbeck's quote. Okay, she says, in light of what happened uh, as a legal matter, and she's talking about Aaron Andrews getting stalked by two different men in the same year, uh, as an inexcusable as it was for that horrific guy to go in and try to peep in her hotel room, Hasselbeck said, I mean, in some way, if I'm him, I'm like, man, I could have just waited 12 weeks and seen this a little bit less without the prison time. And of course, she's referring to the outfits that uh, Aaron Andrews wears on Dancing with the Stars. So, uh, a little bitterness. Uh, Absolutely a little bitterness. For, for no apparent reason. Her outfits are, I don't think, that skimpy. No, her outfits aren't skimpy. Here's the thing. They look like they're skimpy because a lot of dancers' costumes, uh, like, they have this nude-colored material, and yeah. then they have, like, sparkly stuff all over. Yeah, so yeah. it gives you the illusion that the dancer is nude, but they're really not. Right, that's why, you know, it's, I don't mind watching the women dance. And that's why I do mind watching the men dance. I'm against sparkly stuff on guys. Uh, but that's just me. Okay. Okay, so here are some of her outfits. The one in the middle is the outfit that she got the most flack for. And it's not even that bad. She's actually covered completely. And like I said, it's like this nude-colored material that's covering her whole right. body. Right, she looks great. And uh, Hasselbeck's a hater, it's obvious. Right. Uh, but she shouldn't have brought the stalker into it. That was obviously a mistake, right? So uh, she, uh, then, uh, there's a lot of strike back from Aaron Andrews' camp, including her husband, who apparently designed her dresses. Right. Okay, so uh, if your husband's... By the way, he's a designer? I guess. Oh, interesting. Okay. <laughs> okay, anyway, go ahead. All right, so, uh, of course, Aaron Andrews was not happy with these comments, and she said that it was a slap in the face to victims of stalking and sexual predators, which I agree with. Uh, she continues to say, the thing that, wa that I was most upset about is I felt, uh, I felt that she was mocking the situation. As a mother and a woman, I'm disappointed she went there. Mm, don't it. Okay, obviously Aaron Andrews is right. Uh, Elizabeth Hasselbeck uh, recognizes this uh, on the next day's program and gives a weepy apology, which is always fun. So let's check that out. With the dancing and the most improvement. Speaking of Aaron Andrews, who we just saw, you know, we talked about Dancing with the Stars yesterday, and I went home, wasn't feeling that great about it, and I'm sitting there with Grace, my five-year-old, and she said, Mommy, you know, why do you look so sad? And I said, well, Grace, today, hmm, Mommy hurt someone's feelings, and oh, gosh, whew. And it's harder when you're explaining it to your kid, but it was a moment that I thought I should explain to her, so I, yesterday, when we're talking about Aaron, uh, even though I was focused on the dis detestable criminal who's behind bars, thankfully, who's really made her life a living hell and um, is in jail, I ended up hurting her. And so I told Grace, I said, Grace, mommy feels really bad because I hurt somebody. So I took out her little devotional that we read and I read her, you know, mommy always reads you reckless words pierce someone's heart like a sword. And I told her and I mm. promised her that I would <coughs> use my words more mindfully like I try to do to build people up, not break them down. And thankfully, she's five and so cute. And she said to me, Mommy, why don't you just call Erin and tell her you're sorry? <laughs> so thankfully, I listened to her. She's a wise little girl, and I did. So I'm really sorry, and I wanted to offer that publicly, too, even, even though I did follow that advice. So sorry to get emotional about it. I don't like to hurt somebody, so sorry, Erin. What well, about all the years? You've turned on me. <laughs> Where are the tears for me? Uh, Elizabeth Hasselbeck also went on to say... <laughs> <laughs> Alright, I'm playing. But you know, it was a cute little trick she used there uh, to make her seem more emotionally appealing by bringing her five-year-old kid into it. Of course, yeah. Oh, I was telling my five-year-old kid, and then we turned to the devotional. And we talked about how her words can pierce a heart like a sword, and... Oh, my God. It just calm down and say, look, uh, I was being a little raggy, you know, and, uh, and, and I shouldn't have gone there. And, uh, you know, just, just uh, pull a Tim Hardaway. Just give her a you know, I regret it. I'm sorry. You're saying I'm sorry. That was just my mistake and my bad. I'm I, sorry. I love that every time, okay? Just play that and be cool. You don't have to bring your five-year-old kid into it. And then I was telling her, and then she cried, mm -hmm. and I cried, and aren't I a good person? Okay, you apologize. That's all you need to do. You don't have to get carried away.
we, we were going to, you know, I, I don't agree with Elizabeth Hasbuck 98% of the time, but I was going to let her go. Right. You know what I think happened? Okay, of course there are people out there that, like you and I, we don't care, right? Uh -huh. it, we're, not, we're not emotionally disturbed by what Elizabeth Hasselbeck has to say. Yeah. But of course there are people who watch The View and they're crazy and they probably sent her harassing emails and she probably got freaked out by that and then, you know, she goes on air and she overcompensates. I'm so sorry what I said about Aaron Andrews Press. Okay, just calm down, man. Although, on the other hand... JR would probably say the same thing about us and our Justin Bieber apology. I know. Ah, think about it. Think about it. <laughs> it always sounds like they're kind of laughing. All right. Uh, let's take a quick break here. Come right back. Get red like a snapper when they do that. Got your whole block saying true that. If only they knew that. It was you who was irregular. So All right. Back on the Young Turks. Uh, well, we got an interesting situation here. Uh, we are supposed to talk to Ken Klukowski and Ken Blackwell, former Secretary of State uh, in Ohio, uh, about their book, The Blueprint, Obama's Plan to Subvert the Constitution and Build an Imperial Presidency. Uh, but Ken Blackwell is mysteriously not answering his phone, uh, which uh, is questionable. But Klukowski is on. Maybe he can uh, help explain that. Hey, uh, Ken, did, did Ken Blackwell run away? What's his story? Why, why is he not on the show? Good evening. I, I'm not quite sure where he's at. He's, uh, I know he's on travel right now, so he's in between locations. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, I'm not sure exactly where he's at. I apologize in advance if we're unable to connect with him. Yeah, yeah, uh, that would be interesting. Okay, um, so uh, your book is The Blueprint, Obama's Plan to Subvert the Constitution and Build an Imperial Presidency. Tell me about this nonsense. Well, I, 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 actually, I'd say with the book, uh, I probably wouldn't term it as nonsense. Uh, oh, really? the, the, what, we explore, what we explore in the book is that the Constitution designs the executive to have strict limits on his power. And, uh, and in fact, many of those limitations were put in uh, directly as a result of concern over what the colonists perceived as abuses of power, I agreed. Like agreed. Book. I agreed 100 percent, Ken. So let's move on to uh, present day when the, uh, I'm sure you're livid about Republicans uh, trouncing the Constitution and saying that we shouldn't give people Miranda rights. Maybe we should even revoke their citizenship without even trying them. I, I know you're livid about that, right? Well, I, I'd certainly be livid about anything that's unconstitutional. The only thing that I've heard about revoking citizenship was proposed by the uh, year 2000 Democratic vice presidential nominee, not a Republican. Now, in oh, terms you mean of Joe Miranda Lieberman? Rights, you mean Joe Lieberman, right? You think that guy's a Democrat? Please. Right, well, and even if you want to set aside Joe Lieberman, uh, FDR summarily executed uh, foreign combatants who were captured on U.S. soil during World War II. So I'm not sure I would agree that Miranda is necessarily a constitutional requirement. I'm not sure. Well, you would be disagreeing with the Supreme right Court, right? By. You would be disagreeing with the Supreme Court, right? So, uh, not necessarily. Under Dickerson and Chief Justice Rehnquist's opinion, he said that there is a constitutional dimension to Miranda, the Miranda decision of the 1960s, though he said it was uh, based on theories that need to be explored further, and even though there is a constitutional dimension to it, that nonetheless Miranda is limited. Ken, are you seriously arguing that the Supreme Court is unclear on whether you have Miranda rights? No, absolutely not. What I'm saying is th the Supreme Court said that Miranda has a constitutional basis for domestic law enforcement, but not for war-making powers under the foreign policy purviews of the president under what, his article for the, for, commander for, in for example, for the Times Square bombing, that, that appears to be in, in New York, New York. That would be in the United States of America by an American citizen. Now, that's unfortunate. That's terrible. So was Tim McVeigh. That was unfortunate and terrible, et cetera, et cetera. So, I, I mean, I don't get it. I thought you guys were on the side of the Constitution. What, uh, why are you we, making we an argument? We certainly are. The reality okay. is that FDR captured saboteurs Well, you're going back the, to 1873. Hey, 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 what are you second. doing Do you want here? me to answer your question, or do you want to talk? Okay, no, I just, I don't know why we're talking about FDR. I'm asking you about what's happening today. Well, my, my point is, you said this is a Republican outrage, and I'm pointing out that the most recent summary execution of saboteurs during wartime was done by a Democrat president. I understand that was in the middle of a war. I don't want to go back and debate FDR. Okay, so look, the well, recent Republican second, president, the hey, hey, Ken, that Ken, that Ken the recent Republican was... president is the guy who ordered torturing people, uh, the guy who ordered uh, the arrest of Jose Padilla, who's an American citizen, uh, and denied him all of his uh, habeas corpus and all of his rights. And I'm sure you were 
outraged by that, right? I am outraged whenever anyone is denied their constitutional rights. Uh, now, and you wrote a book about how Bush. Uh, exactly and you wrote a book about how Bush. Are of a wartime combatant. You you wrote a book about how Bush uh, stripped Padilla of his American uh, rights, and you were outraged, right? Uh, I'm sorry uh, of of how pr- the pr- of how former President Bush stripped two of his constitutional Jose rights. Jose Padilla. Uh, uh, my understanding is that the courts upheld his rights. I'm unaware of any abrogation of his constitutional rights. No, no, no. Rights. The courts told uh, the Bush administration, you so can't, I have to say, you I'm, can't I'm do that. It doesn't exactly come up in our book, though we do take a stand that regardless of the, par- the president's party, that every constitutional provision needs to be given its full force and effect. So, Ken, uh, uh, th- I'm sure that applies for the Fourth Amendment. So a warrantless search and seizure is most obviously against the Fourth Amendment, and I'm sure you were outraged about that and wrote a book about it, right? Warrantless search and seizures of whom? If you're talking about American citizens on U.S. soil in a peacetime setting, yes, I would be utterly outraged about that. But that's what Bush did. I'm unaware. Is there anything in the public record? I'm unaware of any U.S. citizen who was warrantless wiretapped within the U.S. <laughs> well, that's the cute little trick that they did. They said, "Look, uh, we." In well, fact, by the, by the end, after the New York, right. hold on, did let me explain. Uh, no, after the New York Times broke the story, they said, "Okay, oh, they caught us. I can't believe they revealed our national secrets." Yeah, we did do warrantless searching, but na 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 na. You don't get to find out who we did it to now, because now, way, it's all state secrets. Except, I, we, did out, except we did find out. Except we did find out. Out, and the Arab Americans who actually sued about that in uh, the Northwest were ju- shown by a jury I and mean, by a judge that they were right that they won't warrantlessly wiretap. What's that? So wait, look, I'm telling you what happened in the case in the Northwest. Three hundred pages. That doesn't come up one way or the other. President Obama's policy is the same as President Bush. Do you want to talk about that, or do you want to talk about what's in the book? Uh, okay, okay, so that, uh, so that was the warrantless wiretapping was not in the book either. And, and by the way, they also, and this is an ABC News report, you can look it up, they w- uh, wiretapped our American soldiers in Iraq and listened in on their sex conversations. Uh, was that in your book? I did not uh, discuss uh, sex conversation wiretapping in my book. No, okay, that well, that's interesting, because you say the title of the book is The Blueprint, Obama's Plan, Obama's Plan. To subvert the Constitution and build an imperial presidency. That's exactly right. Huh, that's interesting. All right, now make your since you didn't care about that at that. all when the Republicans were in charge, and you didn't give a lick about the Constitution or the imperial presidency when the Republicans were in charge. I, Ken I, Kukowski, I, I, why don't you tell me about what Obama's doing? Discuss any of the topics in our book as to how President Obama is subverting. Have the Constitution. at it, Hoss. Hit me. Go, go ahead. What is Obama doing that's so bad that all of a sudden you care about the Constitution? Well, there's a number of things. First of all, there's the issue of running executive policy out of the White House through czars that are not confirmed by the U.S. Senate and not accountable. Did Bush have czars? I'm sorry? Did Bush have czars? Did Reagan have czars? Who created the, uh, the drug czar? Go ahead, tell me. Well, it, now, to the extent that there are any czars that are unconstitutional, by all means, that has to be opposed. And did you now, write a book about it when the Republicans had czars? Did you write a book about it when the Republicans had czars? The Republicans had dozens of czars. Did you write a book about it then, or did you wait till a Democrat's in office? Authority without Senate confirmation. But they had the same exact situation under Republicans, and you admit well, wait, wait, that. So wait, why didn't you write a book about it then? What what Reagan era czar was exercising executive authority? What does that mean? Look, they're all, the czar doesn't mean anything. It's a word that's made up. No, I, I, there I, is I, no I, actual technical not. czar. Do you know that? Do you know that? Do you know that? Do you know that czar doesn't mean anything? That it's a made up word? And the energy department, what policies they need to design regarding cap and trade, regarding carbon emissions, regarding energy policy. So is that it your is contention? That is a direct exertion of executive authority. You have Ken Feinberg, the pay czar who has the unilateral authority to reduce the compensation of any publicly traded company that's receiving public funds. Ken, is none of that took place in the previous administration, either Republican no, none, or none. Democrat. Bill so, Clinton Ken, let me no get this right, because I want to make sure you're saying something absolutely false. Okay? Are you saying that uh, none of the czars in previous administrations had any executive authority whatsoever, but then all of a sudden when Obama came in, the same exact czars and some new ones, all of a sudden, boom, they have executive authority and they're oh, running no, them up. A- absolutely not. To the oh, you're not that, saying For that. example, to the extent that a drug czar would advise a president, either Democrat or Republican, 
that's fine. To the extent that a drug czar, either Republican or Democrat, would be exercising executive authority. What does that mean? I call, I call that prob- That means issuing legally binding directives that impact private citizens. So and you private agree that the drug czar did the same exact thing under Republicans and Democrats? And, and I'll make absolutely clear that if someone is not a Senate-confirmed official in that regard, that's problematic. Now, a number of people... Okay, and that problem House, you wrote about before Obama, right? Because it existed actually, before uh, Obama. Well, hang on. A number of the people in the White House are actually Senate-confirmed. And to the extent that they are, if they are fully susceptible to transparency laws in the Administrative Procedure Act, then that's okay, whether they're called a czar or not. But these people who are appointed to offices that were not created by Congress, the officers holding them not subject to Senate confirmation and not subject to congressional oversight, to the extent that those people advise the president, that's fine. But to the extent that any of those people exercise executive authority over American citizens, that's where it becomes unconstitutional. Yeah, and here's what I think. I think those czars had almost the identical power under Republicans, and that you never gave a damn about it, but now Glenn Beck says, Zar, it sounds no, Russian! You, you it sounds you Russian! Go, go, go! And you admit here, hey, 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 you admit here that they almost had the same exact power, but Ken uh, Feinberg, no, who's a new czar, has slightly more executive authority sprinkled in, and so all of a sudden you're outraged by this. And I find that disingenuous. So give me uh, example number two. Ken Klukowski is the author of the blueprint, the Obama's plan to subvert the Constitution and build an imperial presidency. Give me example number two of how he's sure, subverting the Constitution. Absolutely. I'll give you another example. Attempting and contemplating doing cap and trade or doing card check through administrative action instead of through legislation passed by Congress. That would wow. violate the Constitution. You got him. You got him, man. You weren't worried about Warren Swart tapping, but you're worried about... An administrative action on card check? So do you understand that our regulatory agencies regulate, that they make well, wait, regulatory uh, well, decisions all of the time? Wait, wait, no, wait, hang on a second. Article 1, Section 1, Clause 1 of the Constitution says that all federal legislative power is vested in Congress, not in the executive. And the Supreme Court made clear as early as 1928 in the Hampton case that Congress can never, under any circumstances, delegate its legislative authority to the executive branch. You the just executive read me the part of the Constitution that says that Congress makes laws. Of course it does! For the executive branch to make legislation. <laughs> And, and so, I know, because of, because you're saying Congress makes the laws, not the executive. I couldn't agree more, right? So, and, and so, I, I don't know, all of a sudden that means you're against all the regulatory authority that the oh, president no, 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 has. Not against because I know, the, I know the Republicans are against executive authority, regulations right? Regulations are made pursuant to the Take Care Clause in Article 2 regarding executive authority. That is that the executive branch must take care that the laws be faithfully executed. Thank you. That That's gives right. Them the authority okay. to pass regulations. Exactly to right. Regulations that apply legislation. So when it, it denies them the power to make public policy. That's which exactly is that right. Only so Ken, can do. That, that's a Democrat controlled Congress. Yeah, I would perfect, add. Ken. So we agree that the uh, Congress passed the laws, the uh, executive branch uh, carries out those laws, and it's the job of Congress to do so. Now, they have done so under Republicans and Democrats, uh, and in the execution of those laws, under Republicans and Democrats, they have had regulatory authority to execute those laws. Okay. Now you're all of a sudden rediscovering this thing. But what I find interesting is, hey, you know when uh, Bush was president, he does this thing called uh, 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 signing statements. Where he would say, yeah, the Congress, yes, hold on, hold on, meaning. let me finish, let me finish. Wait, hold on, let me finish. So he said, ah, yeah, this bill, it looks pretty good, except I don't like this part, and I don't like this part. So I'm going to write a signing statement saying, I'm not going to do those parts. I'm just going to do the parts I like. Well, I, well, now, now that's grossly all, unconstitutional, right? Also issuing signing statements, but whether it's Obama or Bush, it's irrelevant. Legally, signing statements are legally nothing. They mean nothing. So you're against that. And when law. Bush was doing signing statements, you were outraged and writing about his plan to subvert the Constitution and build an imperial presidency. No, you wrote that it book, right? No, subvert the Constitution because they have no legal effect. No, but Either he was president trying Bush to... Or no, no first Obama. of all, Ken, there's two things, things wrong with that. have no legal force. You, there's two things wrong with that. Number one, he was trying to subvert the Constitution by doing the signing statements. And second of all, 
it does have an effect when he tells the executive branch who's supposed to enforce the laws, hey, do not enforce the laws that Congress passed and I signed into law. That's what he told his executive branch, well, and I'm well, sure I, you I wrote a point, book about it. I'm not sure that there's any example of a law where the president instructed the executive branch not to follow it. Are you familiar? Can you cite any specific statute, any specific law yes, I that can. was not executed as That's a result right. of the signing in, in, statement? In 2005, when they passed the law against torture, saying that they must be you must follow the Army Field Manual, Bush wrote a signing statement saying, no, you must not, even though he publicly said, yeah, I'll follow the law. No, and he did a second. signing statement, signing he statement said, said you do not, not have to follow that law. No, no, the signing statement said that this law shall only be implemented insofar as it is consistent with the president's commander-in-chief power. Right, and the president well, that's, said, that's in my state, uh, ultimate power is, as executive, I tell you, torture is people. A statement of a truism. Any law that's unconstitutional, any unconstitutional application of an otherwise valid law is in and of itself a nullity. That would be like President Obama. If Congress were to pass a law and Obama were to say, I'm not going to apply this in a way that would forbid people going to synagogue, well, uh, of course not, because that would be unconstitutional. So a signing statement that says, I will not use this law in an unconstitutional manner, it's just stating the legal truism. There's no, there's no legal effect there one way or the other. So it's, the law was so illegal. What he tried to do was so illegal, it didn't really matter anyway. So what I'm hearing from you, Ken Klukowski, is when Bush did the warrantless wiretapping, when he did the signing statements, when he had the czars, you weren't outraged at all. You thought no, it was not, no not big deal. But when Obama does one-tenth of it, all of a sudden you're writing about the imperial presidency. Constitutional, whether it's a Republican president or a Democrat president. Ken, president I don't Clinton believe you. Them, and I, had I no think you are lying. That. I think you are totally full of it. Because when, I, when Obama did his first signing statement, I went ballistic on this show. Because okay. we don't give a damn if he's a Democrat or Republican. We care about the Constitution. I think you don't care about the Constitution at all. What you want to do is say, oh, he's a Democrat, oh, he's imperial president, czar, 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 czar. Okay, and you want to well, scare people with nonsense. You can read my because mind. I, mean, I know, I no, no, you never wrote the book. When Bush was doing all that stuff, you didn't do a damn thing because you never cared about the Constitution. All you want to do is use it as a way to attack a Democratic president. You know, I am so glad that you're a mind reader. We need to I'm not a mind reader. You tell me. I'm asking you. you what book did you write about Bush's imperial the presidency? Around the world are thinking. I think Ken, I've helpful. asked you a million times. What book did you write about Bush's imperial presidency? I wasn't writing a book. Oh, you weren't? Huh, that's weird. All of a sudden you, care to, you decide to write a book about the Constitution when Obama's president and doing the same things but not nearly as bad as Bush. Funny how that turned out. So, so what made you love the Constitution all of a sudden when Obama got elected? Were you like, oh my God, golly gee, workers, the Constitution. I just read it, Executive Clause number one, two, three. When did you read the Constitution? Was it before or after Obama got elected? Uh, the first time I read the Constitution would have been in the early 1990s. All right. Well, I would have loved if you had written a book back then or during uh, the last decade when we had a president who was yeah, sorry to shredding it that, that you, had, you had actually written or showed any outrage. Do you know that you're trying to trick the people uh, you're leading, the right-wing people who follow you, into th thinking that Obama's not following the Constitution but, but your boys did? Or, or do you genuinely believe the things you said? Well, everything I write, I, I certainly stand by. Uh, to make laws without Congress is unconstitutional. Uh, citing international authority as binding in U.S. courts would be unconstitutional. Allowing executive authority to be, uh, to be implemented by, uh, by individuals that are principal authors under Article II but are, not, uh, but are not confirmed by the Senate is, uh, is unconstitutional. Every single thing you mention. George W. Bush did, and you didn't write a damn thing about it. Yeah, right, I, I don't again, believe. I'm not sure about any. Okay. I'm not sure about right. any czars going on uh, hey. along those lines. Hey, I will tell you what. I'll even hand you one. Oh, I yeah. thought that when uh, I thought that when President Bush signed uh, McCain-Feingold, I thought there were some provisions of McCain-Feingold that were unconstitutional, wow. and I was wow. critical about that in That's every outlet amazing. that I could get, and I criticized yeah. that law. That was yeah. By book. the way, for the people at home who don't know McCain-Feingold. That was the one that said, hey, uh, corporations can't uh, spend in our elections uh, uh, without any kind of control. So it's shocking that Ken, you're uh, in favor no, of corporations. No, no, that's, that's, wow, that's weird. I didn't see true. that coming. Yeah, uh, Ken Cluckwell in favor of uh, 
uh, I'm sorry, Klukowski in favor of corporate America. That's a big shocking I know thing. that's not an issue of corporate America. No, no, 70, of course not. Seventy no. percent of the corporations no, in America are one-man operations. Uh, I know. There was I know. nothing McCain Feingold saying if you have more than fifty employees or more than a thousand employees or if you have more than this amount of money. You're restricted. Uh, it, no, 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 you're right. No, look, I should be fair. I should be fair. write a check to engage in political speech during uh, election season. All right, Ken, you know, you're right. I should be fair because it wasn't just about corporate America. It was about overall spending, okay? And so you were in favor of all the rich people who could spend as much as money as they can to buy the election. So fair is fair. You're well, right. Well, actually, they, 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 could, they could still do that. George Soros, before I know, this George United Soros. Decision, How about Rupert Murdoch? 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 How about him uh, spending uh, all this money on Fox News and, uh, and New York Post, which he loses $50 million a year on, for propaganda purposes? And uh, how about the Weekly Standard that loses $80 million a year, uh, and they do that for uh, propaganda purposes? How about the Washington Times that loses, that is lost in the ballpark of $2 billion? They do that for propaganda purposes. See, it, how about those guys? Oh, you don't mention those guys. You only mention George Soros because you think he's on the left. Look, I'm glad that we're getting to a topic that we do talk about in the book where we discuss how the Supreme Court explored the issues, not just in this case, but in previous cases, as to this type of censorship regime could actually enable government censorship of the media itself. And that was the concern expressed by the majority, not just in Citizens United, but in previous cases as well. I know, and you're very for concerned. that reason... For that reason, McCain-Feingold had a press exemption. So all of the corporations you just mentioned, they weren't even covered by McCain-Feingold. No, I mentioned that in the context of the only rich guy you seem to want to attack is the one guy who's actually fought communism and is on the side of uh, controlling the banks and is on oh, the no, side no, of Oh, no, no, I'm not attacking that. If, okay. if George Soros wants George to spend a million bucks, I believe he has the right to do so. I just believe that everyone else has the right to do so on equal terms with him. Of course. If you have, course. If you have ordinary citizens that can't spend a million bucks on an election, if you have maybe 10,000 citizens who can only give 100 bucks each to make a million dollars, I think those 10,000 citizens should have exactly the same rights that George Soros has. They have the same rights right now. They give a limited amount of money. That's the right way to do it. Anyway, no, no, listen, no, no, we're no, far no, Wait a second. All right, all right. No, no well, I'm not waiting a second. Hey, listen, Ken Klukowski, we are out of time. And uh, the book is called The Blueprint, Obama's Plan to Subvert the Constitution, Build an Imperial Presidency. I have no interest in your nonsense, George Soros point. And the next time you go to do an interview and you say Ken Blackwell is going to be on, uh, tell him not to be a coward and actually show up in the interview, okay? Uh, Ken Blackwell is, uh, is certainly not a coward. If he's oh, really? Boston, Where is he? I'm sure Where is he? Where was your book about Bush, and where the hell is right Ken Blackwell now? Oh, he's conveniently I mean, traveling. In fact, last Friday, I wasn't, on, I wasn't on a joint interview myself because I couldn't get on the line last, last yeah, Friday morning. I'm sure. So, and I mean, we're both traveling authors. That happens. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm sure it does. All right, Ken Klikowski, thanks for being on. All right, and, and, so, and let me guys tell you a part of the reason I'm mad about this, okay? So you all know the context. They tell us in the beginning, this, the authors here, that Ken Blackwell is going to be on. Then they say, oh they, oh, they found out what the Young Turks is. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, I meant Ken Blackwell and Ken Kalkowski is going to be on. And then right before the interview, they say, oh, I'm sorry, Ken Blackwell is not going to be on. It's only Ken Kalkowski because he doesn't, Ken Blackwell is too scared to come on the Young Turks. Okay. Well, don't write a bunch of lies in your book, a bunch of BS, and then send this guy to come and uh, propagate that BS if you aren't man enough to come on here and defend your BS positions yourself. This book is total crap, and no one with any sense should buy it. How do you like me now, Young Turks?